Hey everybody, it's Paul with Reporting Live from my sofa, but we are on a field trip. As you can see behind me, we have gone inland away from the hurricane. Now we are <clears throat> basically out of harm's way for major weather, but where we're at, it's probably still gonna get a ton of raining. And it's actually looking around, I'm like, please let me film this, please let me film this, because it's getting darker and all that kind of stuff. So that being said, uh, you're probably gonna hear some birds going in the background and other type of country life type things, which I personally love. And I think it makes a pleasant background to discuss day two of the Brooke Schuyler Richardson saga. Y'all, this trial has me up one side, down the next, left, right, you name it. So without further ado, let's review. Now, we're gonna talk about the opening statements first. So, I've been waiting for these, oh my goodness. So, the state gets up there and they go, they talk about, you know, the relationship with Trey Johnson, who we did get to see on the stand finally, and kind of put to rest that he didn't know anything about this. So that was good, I think, for him and his privacy. Now, the state goes on to talk about that she meets this new guy, she breaks up with Trey, she blocks him on social media, says she wants to focus on cheerleading, so on and so forth. Now, they go into saying that she already suspected that she was possibly pregnant when she went to go see the doctor and that she was going there for birth control. Now, the state talks about how she went there, she finds out she's pregnant, she does an ultrasound, she hears a heartbeat, the baby's alive, which that was major because I was, we'll get into this in a little bit, but I was so interested to see what took place at the doctor's office. Now, the state says that the doctor had a suicide conversation with her because her reaction was like so severe uh, that he had this conversation with her about suicide or hurting the baby, and that he asked her to schedule an, another ultrasound and gave her instructions when she left there about, you know, you need to come in for this appointment, and that she essentially just ignored all of these. Later in the day, we'll learn through a sidebar that this is legal, that she, you know, in Ohio, you're not obligated to go get this kind of treatment like prenatal care and stuff like that which I thought was an interesting tidbit to learn because at first and I still I, once we see more evidence come out I'm just really curious to see can she get in trouble for not having done any of this stuff but it doesn't look like she can now there's also some information about the doctor accidentally sending an email to her mother that contained information about her pregnancy that her mother received and this is like another bombshell type thing because there's so much talk about there about like oh the mom's in on it how did nobody hear how did nobody know da 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 da, da. so that's going to be really interesting and it's going to be really interesting to hear what the mother says in the stand because i too was like oh wow you know how do you ignore that and, and essentially it, it, it kind of sounds to me like Skylar is basically like oh it's a big mistake da 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 and the mother just went with that so i before before I get too judgy on that one, I just, I want to hear from the horse's mouth. I want to hear what the mom says. I want to see the direct evidence of that. Now, another thing that we learn while the state's up there is that the mother was very obsessive over Scholar's weight and that, you know, whether it was going, losing weight or gaining some weight, it was back and forth. That She just kind of sounded like one of those mothers that had really high expectations, possibly maybe lived a little bit through her daughter and had an image of this is what you need to be. And whatever that was at the time wasn't good enough. Now, another piece that came out that I thought was interesting involving the mother is that she did acknowledge to Skylar that hey if this is true and you're having a baby your life's gonna be over and da 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 so you see that pressure mounting from the mother the text messages that we'll talk about in a minute between her and her mother show a very dysfunctional relationship in regards to that so let's continue so now they get to you know Friday May 5th she goes to the prom she goes into labor basically but she's at the prom the beginning of it she's starting to have these really bad cramps they talk about her being at home on the sofa with heating pads that her her cramps were so bad she's texting with her boyfriend you know talking about it now in the midst of all this she goes to a Reds game with her parents and her boyfriend how she does that, I don't know. I don't know what it's like to be pregnant, obviously. I don't know what cramps are like. I don't know, you know, in that regard. I, I just don't know. So the sounds of it, I'm like, this sounds awful. But it sounds like, okay, she was like in it to win it. She was gonna maintain whatever she needed to and nothing was gonna kind of get in her way of that. Because again, when you tell me like, oh, somebody's in labor and they went and did blank, I'm like, what? How, how would you even do that? So now that night they allege that after everybody 
was asleep. This is when the birth happened. And uh, of course, like we've said before, the state's alleging that you know the baby was born alive. She killed the baby. She took it out back. She buried it and uh, kind of went on her way. Now, another thing that I was just like, oh my God, how did she do that? Is the state's then showing text messages and social media type stuff like within the next 24 hours. So that next day, Skylar goes to the gym and I'm just like, what? I, I mean, I thought you needed to recover. So she was just like psh, psh, gone and it shows her at the gym, you know, taking a belly shot and that kind of stuff. So I was, that was very interesting. Now, also what's interesting is the conversations between her and her mother through text messages. So one of the text messages that was less than 24 hours after the birth was, I'm literally so excited for dinner to wear something cute. Yay, my belly is back. Now I am taking this opportunity to make it amazing. Another one was, I'm literally speechless with how, how happy I am. My belly is back. OMG. I'm never, ever, ever letting it get like this again. You're about to see me look freaking better than before. OMG. The text messages are concerning, y'all. I mean, let's just call a spade a spade. That's, you know, like, whoa. You know? But there's multiple levels and layers to why they're concerning to me. I mean, you know, like I said, first of all, I'm just like, okay, this girl just had a baby, and she's going to the gym, and she's doing this. Now, this sounds to me, a part of it, almost like a, a rubber band type thing of the coming back uh, from trauma, that type situation. Uh, Remarks, you know, because I'm just like, who says that? And it also sounds like somebody who just, you know, was like they got rid of something that they didn't want, and there's like a huge sense of relief. I think we've all experienced that, not in this context, but you know, oh, I just got that exam over with. Oh, I just, you know, got done with that difficult situation at work, whatever the case may be, you know. So that of relief that you get of, oh, okay, I'm, you know, I feel good again. That's what I'm reading into this here. And so that's what makes it kind of like, you know, this is dealing with her baby. Now, she goes back to the same doctor's office, but she sees a different doctor who we will hear from later. We'll hear from both of the doctors that she saw. And this is basically the the beginning of the unfolding of what took place. And so the state goes into that a little bit during opening arguments of, you know, she goes in there, it's discovered, she burst into tears, you know, yada, yada, yada. Now, it was also shown during all of this time that she had done a search about how to get rid of a baby. Uh, the search seemed kind of benign in the way of they didn't seem to be presenting like tons of evidence or saying they were about, you know, you know, hundreds of searches about how to kill a baby or how to get rid of a baby or things of this nature. So, but still, you know, there was that there. So then to kind of round it out there, what jumped out to me with their opening was they did not, they talked about not seeing burning uh, on the bones evidence. But they did, basically he was just like, but the baby, the skin, that part of it could have been burned. And essentially the, the, the death was listed as homicidal violence was the cause of death. So that part I'm very interested because we saw throughout the day where things with the burning notion and all this type stuff. And we're going to get into that in just a minute. So let's go ahead and talk about the defense's opening. So the defense gets up there. He says, you know, we need to put everything in context, yada, 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 which I always agree. Context is a great thing. Uh, and, and he's basically like, there's a bunch of half truths and so on and so forth. So he talks about the story where this is her first OBGYN appointment. You know, she makes the choice to go to the doctor that delivered her. Um, you know, he says that her reaction in that doctor's office was genuine, that she wasn't hiding anything, that there was this genuine, oh my goodness, I'm pregnant. The defense goes into how she's had an eating disorder since age of 12. This has been an issue. She's been in treatment for it, psychological treatment, you know, so on and so forth. And that her weight fluctuated, like basically 40 pounds back and forth all the time. And that this caused, you know, issues with her menstrual cycle and that they show, they show pictures of her to give us an idea of this. And because also one of the big things that they're trying to explain is how nobody knew. And one of the stories is people were like, oh, we just thought she was gaining weight again. And because, I mean, people saw her in bathing suits. I mean, like literally nobody allegedly knew. And so they're just, everyone, of course, is like, well, how? So this is the defense's way of saying, well, this is how. Now the defense says about those text messages that this is how she's been for a long time, that these were not abnormal, that this is how her and her mother did talked with each other. And there was this kind of weird relationship revolving around weight between the two of those. And, and so they're like, you know, 
So the defense is like, you know, well, you're not seeing text messages from when she was in eighth grade and da 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 which is true. You know, I mean, that is true. But nonetheless, I, I would almost just kind of, I, I don't know. The text messages for me were just a little bit like, eh, you know, I, I don't care if guilty, not guilty, whatever. It, it's just kind of an odd thing to go after right after you've gone through something like that, you know, in my little opinion. Now, a huge thing to the point that I should honestly call this video, you know, day two testimony, Fundal Hide. I mean, let's just be honest here, y'all. I never knew what that was. I feel like I could do an essay on it at this point. But that's also the interesting thing about these trials is like what you learn. So basically, it is really big for the defense and the state to get into the fact of how did he take this measurement with a measuring tape or with his hand? Because essentially he's saying that he took it in his notes it's like he used his hand but he's basically saying i always use the measuring tape that's what i do i don't even think about it so i probably did but unfortunately you need proof for that the reasoning they're going into this is because they're essentially trying to say look he gave her the wrong measurement she thought she had 10 weeks left and she had this baby less than two weeks later and that also is adding up to the fact that the baby was small and not healthy. Now the defense shows pictures of her prom dress from when she got it and when she wore the prom. And that was one of the things I think I said in here in a video where I was like, when did she have had to let it out? And they're like, nope, she didn't have to let it out. Da, 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 da. So I thought that was interesting that he brought that up. A lot of the questions that I have are being answered along the way, which I'm really enjoying. Now, the, state, the defense, too, goes to the night of the birth, the whole nine yards. You know, they say she drags this flower pot over and puts it on the thing, on the grave, and, you know, marks the grave, and so on and so forth. And I got a feeling that it was more, because once they showed the evidence pictures, I felt like it was more where she was hiding it, I guess you could say, um, as opposed to, like, a, a, a marker. I mean, if you marked the grave, you, you're, she's not wanting people to find this. I mean, let's just be honest about that. Now, the defense plays clips of the interrogation. This is going to be major. I hope they play the whole thing. Here's my thing with the interrogation. So the defense is essentially claiming, you know, look, she said, because there's a confession part to this, and they're essentially saying, look, she denied this like 29 times or something like that, and only after numerous times of prodding her did she use then their words to kind of tell them what they wanted to hear. A big thing in regards to the burning aspect is the state claims that, you know, Brooke basically said, I, I put a lighter to the baby and tried to cremate her a little bit. Well, this was after the interrogators were telling her, well, it looks a lot better if you had a meaning behind burning her as opposed to just throwing a baby in a fire. You know, did you try and cremate her? So I can see where they're going with that because I do sense like, okay, there is this little aspect where she's saying words back to them. So I, I'm very interested to see where that goes. Now, another thing that went on the defense claims is that during this process when they were interviewing her, the, the investigators already knew that the parents were asking for the remains back to have a burial. So they were kind of using that as like, say, a manipulative tactic to be like, look, you know, you're not going to get these remains back. You can't have these until you tell us the truth, so on and so forth. So, you know, the officer, one of them sitting there holding her hand. It, it just, it, it was an awkward feeling. But again, these are the opening statements and little clips. So I want to see, just the same way the defense says context, I need to see that context too from their side of the fence. But that is very compelling evidence for me. So we meet a couple of the first uh, witnesses that come up. Like we said, Tyler gets up there. He's, you know, basically we just established that this is the father and he was unaware of this, so on and so forth. And so that was laid to rest. Uh, then we get Ashley, who is a medical assistant at the doctor's office. And she was super nervous, I'm thinking, because she just kind of fumbled on some basic stuff. And, you know, so I'm just guessing that maybe she was really, really nervous. But she just basically establishes the meeting that she went through with Skylar. Uh, she said that Skylar was very nervous. And basically, you know, what she does when a patient comes in and whatnot. She did also confirm that when Skylar came back and whatnot, that she could hear sobbing coming through the walls. And when Tyler, when Skylar found out that she was pregnant. She did say that when Skylar returned for the visit that essentially got her called, that she could hear her sobbing through the walls. And that allegedly was like during the time she confessed to the doctor what happened. So let's talk about Dr. Andrews. So again, this is the doctor that gave birth to her. He comes in, he's like, oh, she's here. 
he understands that she's there for birth control. Um, he said that she's like nervous, you know, comes in, how can I help? I'm here for this. You know, he said that one thing that was the menstrual times that she told him as well as Ashley, the assistant, didn't really match up with one another. She did decline to have the gynecologist exam that day. Uh, and so they did a urine test for her. Uh, it came back that she was pregnant. She became, you know, basically was crying. I can't have this baby college starts or something like that. There was a remark to that nature. Uh, this is when he goes into the fundal height test. It's so prevalent. And so that it showed 32 centimeters. Now by hook or crook, however, he came up with it. That's the number he came up with. And so that again is a huge point of contingency because she had the baby just 11 days later. And so essentially one thing that the defense is getting at is, look, this clearly is showing that something's wrong with the baby. So you know, do with that what you will. One thing the doctor says about that though is he had no gestation date or time or period to go on, so it would be really hard to have a measuring stick to say, well, what's abnormal or normal for this, you know, pregnancy right now. Now he does say that they take her into the ultrasound room and they do what I guess is like a real quick informal type of sonogram and that the baby did have a heartbeat, that it was normal, that all the vitals looked very normal for this child, which I thought was interesting because just 11 days later it's still born, but any, I mean, this, you know, is not, this can happen. Now he says that he did tell her that she needed to tell someone about the pregnancy. He also explained that, you know, look, somebody would, people would line up to raise this baby and I think what he meant in a roundabout way is like her parents and people like that but I mean apparently she didn't think this in her mind. Now the doctor did say that if she was taking the birth control that it wouldn't have affected the baby at that point. Now he did say that what he did is he discontinued the script that he had written her like after she left or whatever. He says he did tell her to get started with prenatal care and wanted her back in like ASAP to go to these, you know, the appointments to get this started to make sure that she and the baby were okay. Another reason that was cited about trying to get her back in, and it's very cumbersome, but it's with insurance and basically like she was going to be out, pay, or out of network. And so if you got in before this timeline, it made this possible and yada, yada, yada. So there was like a rush to be like, come back in. He does say that it wasn't because he felt the baby's in distress though. Now he did say that she never followed back up, so he got a nurse and like say the nurse's manager to try and reach out and get her, but nobody could ever get a hold of her again. Now fast forward a little bit in time, we're gonna see Dr. Boyce's testimony. Now this is the doctor that she saw when she came back to the clinic after the birth and she was going to basically do a follow-up for more birth control. So now Dr. Boyce essentially says that before Skylar even got back there, that Ashley and basically everyone had a little meeting saying, look, this girl was pregnant you know, when she was here last, so just know that going into it. So the doctor comes in, she confirms like, why are you here? I'm here for birth control. And the doctor is essentially like, look, I have to ask, you know, you were pregnant when you came in here, you know, what happened with your baby? And at this point, Skylar kind of just breaks down, she starts crying and essentially just tells her everything. She said, I, you know, I had it by my, I had it by myself at my house. I buried it in the backyard, no one knew. And the doctor's basically like, you know, I'm sure her mouth was on the floor. And she said that she said, you know, I was just kind of in shock. And one of the things that she was just, she's like, nobody heard you. And you know, this is such a painful, huge experience. And Skylar's like, I know, I know, I know. I mean, I'm sure for her, if that truly was the first person that ever knew about this, I mean, can you imagine caring? carrying that around and then letting it all hang out with somebody. So I'm sure she was like, Wah! and this is where Ashley testified that she could hear sobbing coming out of the room, so on and so forth. Now this doctor does suggest to her that she gets professional help like counseling because of just the mental trauma for this. The doctors does say, look, I can give you a physical exam and Skylar says, no, I don't want that. The doctor doesn't push it because she was basically like, it, so much time had gone by, it, the body kind of heals itself in time, so I didn't want to push it any more than I needed to, and whatever was done was kind of done at that point. Now, one thing that Skylar said to her that's kind of a point of interest with everybody is, I went and buried everything. And so there's a, what is everything? Because Skylar didn't really tell this person a bunch of information, like about, you know, stillborn, stuff like that, like details. So, but the doctor did say that she had, you know, essentially described the baby as being stillborn, and that's what it was at that point. Nobody knew really any differently. 
Now, one thing the defense does with this type of stuff is they're like, well, she chose to go back there, yada, yada, yada. And the state quickly comes up and is like, well, you know, we don't, you, asking the doctor, you don't know what her specifics are if she basically doesn't have a choice but to come to y'all. And the doctor's like, no, I don't know that. And, and I mean, I agree. I get where the defense is going with that, you know, and I can see that, but there's so many, I mean, y'all know how it is. There's so much stuff that goes on that makes it to where you're like, well, I might not necessarily want to go to this place, but that's the only provider I have that I can afford to go to or whatever. So that doesn't hold too much water with me. So let's jump into some of the crime scene investigation. So th we go through kind of a slew of like crime scene techs that get up there. Uh, we had, you know, McKay, we had McKay, Mr. Smith, and we'll get to the corner last. But the state goes over like the house, the yard, uh, the property line, all that type of stuff. Uh, where the body site was, obviously the remains. It's interesting to see where, because when you say buried in, when you say buried in the backyard, you're thinking, you know, oh, right in the backyard. Well, now that we see, no, it's kind of a little bit of a hike to this tree line. And it's kind of in this little, you know, trees. I, to me, I was like, if, if this hadn't gone down, nobody probably would have ever found it. Because one thing that I was thinking and had read and stuff like that is I was like, well, maybe, you know, if it's in the yard, I mean, wasn't her dad mowing the grass or brother, whoever, um, maybe it got run over and that's where the skull fractures came from. I mean, I had all sorts of little theories on this. But seeing it where it was, I was like, oh, no, that's, you know, that's that's off in the cut. So some other little points of interest with this are, you know, they, a little cloth was found. You know, they established that it does not look like the cloth had any kind of burning to it. Uh, they talk about getting DNA from Skylar. Now, one, this was very interesting to me. So we get into some of the blue star, the luminol evidence inside the house. And essentially Skylar's bed had been moved and under the bed there was an area that basically the carpet had been scrubbed down, you know, gone. And when they sprayed luminol, it was very reactive. The officer, Mr. Smith, I believe up there, said that he felt like the image looked like that of a, a little baby body on the carpet. And so that was interesting because remember, she said she had the baby in the bathroom. Now they also saw essentially bloody footprints for the luminol evidence of it uh, that went from the bedroom to the bathroom. Uh, so, but Mr. Smith got up, he showed the carpet to the jury, the whole nine yards. So I guess one question that I have that I'm curious is, well, what if she did have the baby in the bedroom, but then carried it to the bathroom? Uh, but her story is that she felt like she had to go to the, you know, pee. So she went in and to the bathroom and the baby basically plopped out and that's where this took place. So, you know, we'll see, we'll see if that evidence comes out any further. Now, this is one kind of sore spot that I have with the defense because and, and let me say this so far i like the defense and i like the prosecution i don't feel like anyone it, this is what i like about them i like that everybody is even kill so far there's not this you know Arr! they're letting the evidence come out and just get to the evidence what let the evidence speak for itself and let that rise to the surface so the defense the older gentleman gets up there and like he does this thing about he shows pictures of the the bedroom and how it was messed up and you know he's like did y'all put that back you know so he did that number one he's getting snippy with mr smith and he's like well why'd you take a picture of the lighter in her room if you didn't picture the cam candles did you not think about that and luckily mr smith is like can i clarify and he does and it's logical the reason that he did this because he was told to he didn't pick those out so that's just kind of like really do we have to go there everyone's being so nice so far but then, and I call these like dime store tactics, the defense plays this recording and it sounds like someone going, <laughs> and he's like, is it funny looking for blood? And I'm just like, okay, this is not, we don't need this yet because here's my thing. If you were to ask me straight up who gets points on this first day of evidence uh, and testimony, I would say the defense did by naturally because the prosecution with what they're alleging it's not looking like a strong case with evidence. There's not a, you know, type thing. Now, it is the second day in the trial, y'all. They could show some bombshell stuff because my mouth has dropped on the floor for both things. I'm going back and forth with this because at the end of it, no matter what, you know, it, we can sit here and be like, why did she make this decision to kind of handle things the way she did? I mean, obviously. So... I'm prepared for bombshell evidence from the prosecutors and the defense, but I just felt at this point that taking these tactics by the defense isn't necessary. And let's be honest, let's just go ahead and say the R word. 
we are still reeling from the Rosenbaums over here and, and that whole trial. And so any sign of that, I'm like, is this necessary? Is this necessary? So anyways, I digress. Let's keep going. So the coroner gets up there. And y'all, this is becoming like a 30-minute video. I apologize. So we're just going to get to the chase with the coroner. They do a lot of stuff about the bones and unearthing them and this and that. But let's get to the chase of it where the coroner is saying... Look, this is how it went down with that, with the mistake being made over the burning of the bones. Now, he says, I never would have said that the bones were burned, and that that's an incorrect statement, and basically, like, somebody else put that on there, and that, that wasn't said, so it was an incorrect statement. Uh, he says that there was a concern of just a few of the bones having some thermal energy, so they went thermal energy, some thermal in injury to them, <laughs> some thermal en energy. So they went back out, and that's where they started going into the fire pit, and they were like, oh, no, it's not the fire pit. So they went back, and they found more bones over there. So until we hear from the anthropologist up there and hear exactly the words from her mouth, but so far this is no there was no burning and now that's where the state is trying to say well the body was burned and uh, again i want to hear from the i want to hear from the horse's mouth because we can go down many different rabbit holes with this so far and it's so back and forth and right now i'm just feeling like okay yeah because when when skylar said you know i put a lighter to her and tried to cremate her a little that makes literally no sense to me i mean it makes no sense and they're not introducing because i was like this well what about the lighter fluid? And the defense said, you know, but they found it near the fire pit. Isn't that normal? And yeah, it's normal. I have three things of lighter fluid right here that we use for camping and stuff like that. So if you're somebody that does fires and stuff, that's just like a normal thing or grilling or whatever. So that part, I'm just like, uh, you know, I, I just, I want to hear more evidence and I'm just going to go wherever the evidence kind of takes me. So like I said, this is a 30 minute video almost to the point where you just should have watched the, the thing in full trial live whatever uh, but thanks for hanging out with me if you're still here and um, that's it so I'm going to go back inside now and keep watching the trial and then update y'all later I appreciate you hanging out thank you very much y'all have a wonderful day and I will talk to you soon